Tender Strands by Martin Dempsey Chapter 7 Frame Ash was already there by the time Smith arrived. The deceased name had been established to be Mike Lent. He had been found by the hotel's cleaning lady, and what could have been written off as a straightforward heart attack had been flagged for further investigation due to the circumstances surrounding the body and the apparent cause of death. Was he lying like that? He's not being moved? Smith asked. No, he's not being moved. Ash was standing on the opposite side of the single bed that Smith had been standing next to. They were looking across the bed, at one another, and at the corpse. The dead man was lying on his back, his knees neatly over the edge of the bed. He was wearing a business suit, his tie loosened, his shoes still done up. His open suitcase faced his feet on the floor. It looks as if he sat on the bed, leant forward, opened his case, lay back and promptly died, Smith said. It looked exactly like that, Ash agreed. That's what's so weird about it. The sheets are perfectly unruffled. He didn't kick a suitcase even. He just lay back and had a heart attack. Smith's request for a forensics team had been granted and they had just arrived before Smith. So the two left the room and stood outside in the hall, catching up and exchanging small talk while the white clad stormtroopers, which I saw referred to them as, busily swapped, sampled, flagged, photographed and bagged. How's the, uh, the baby? Smith asked. He's good. Happy and healthy. Won't sleep much more than an hour or so, so we're still pulling shifts. Ash was still technically on maternity leave, but had worked on arrangements so that he'd work minimal hours a week to prolong the leave longer. Smith had helped and supported the application for flexible working arrangements, and in return had received a thank you card from Ash's other half, which he hadn't expected, but was touched by. Still very much in the feed me, rock me, change me, put me to bed cycle, and that's just the wife. Smith smiled. That's cute. Two of the forensic team filed out, holding evidence bags. From down the hall, another two officers rounded the corner, pushing a body cart. Smith suppressed a wince and turned back, turned to lean his back against the wall. Did you get a chance to talk with the, um, the, the cleaner? Yes, she basically just opened the door, took a step, requested God's assistance with some urgency, and then called us a slot. Did she open the window? Smith asked. No, she said that was already open before she got in. Hmm. Smith's bow furrowed. Not impossible, but odd. Why would one take the trouble of carrying the suitcase over to the window to open it rather than place it on the bed first? Smith hadn't noticed any rumbling on the bed sheets at all to suggest the case had been placed on it. Maybe the deceased had put it down at the foot of the bed, then stepped over it to go and open the window, then walked back and stepped over it again to sit down and face it before reaching forward to open it. Maybe. Maybe he was just being hypervalent. The deceased could have set the case upright at the foot of the bed, then gone and opened the window, then returned and laid the case flat. That makes more sense. Have we gotten the body's details from reception? I think so. I put in the call to see if there's next of kin. There should be. Wedding ring. Um, uh, yeah. Ash paused and tried to keep his face from reacting. Young for a heart attack. He is and in good shape, comparatively. I can't say for sure, but I think I picked up some marks on the body too. Track marks, maybe, on the wrists. Smith indicated his own forearm. You saw that under the shoot and the shirt cuffs? Ash seemed skeptical. I did, right near the hand. An odd place to shoot up if that's what they were. I want to take an extra long look at that suitcase. Hey, you think I know does? Smith pouted his lips in a mulling over expression. Could be. Have we checked his luggage for anything? What was in the uh, toiletry bag? Smith cleared his throat and shed his copy of the file that Clark had been contemplating towards himself and flipped it open. All right. The purpose of this case meeting is to try to establish a potential modus operandi or shared commonalities, just so we can keep an eye out and maybe flag this up the pole if we can establish a definite pattern going forwards.
Ash nodded with a manufactured look of deep seriousness on his face as he quoted the corporate catchphrase that had been worked its way into usage in the office. Or going around in circles, Clark added with a half suppressed smile. Let the minutes show that we are not in favour of going backwards. Smith leant back in his seat. Can we say that the two cases are related? If so, how? And if we do need to ask for extra support and funding, and we do attempt to take proactive measures outside of continuing to investigate and follow up leads, flag alerts, issues to be on the outlooks, etc. It was the day after Mike Lent had been found, and Smith and Ash had spent most of the last 15 hours attempting to gather and sift through as much evidence as possible. That morning, when Clark arrived, Smith was sitting looking rumpled and grumpy at his desk, staring angrily at an evidence spreadsheet. And when she found a few minutes later, Ash was shaving in the toilets. Her next three hours were spent finding and booking a meeting room, compiling case files, chasing up test results, and printing off copies of documents. Now all three sat in the smallest shared offices, each with a pile of papers in front of them. Ash was playing with a ballpoint pen. Clark had a tall takeaway cappuccino, and Smith picked up each sheet and looked at it with both hands. Smith looked up at Clark. She shuffled her file over her notebook. OK, she said, passing out printed sheets to Ash and Smith. Ignore the Christmas tree icon thingy in the corner. I don't know how that got there. Ash nodded. They appear on some files occasionally. I think it's a flaw with the copier we've got. I think it's the bug in the actual system. I, I see them on case files in other departments too occasionally. Don't worry about it. If, it. if it needs to be, I'll just cover it with a white sticker, copy it, and the case file gets a clean looking version for court. Clark shuffled, shuffled and cleared her throat. <clears> throat> These are the uh, commonalities I have so far. The suspects of the uh, suspicious deaths currently under investigation are male, both in their 30s, both found alone, both experienced what appeared to be heart failure, and both had unusually high levels of serotonin in their bloodstream. Both had puncture marks on their body, uh, waters on his buttocks and on the right side of his neck, uh, lent on his right forearm. Fruit, bananas, uh, were eaten at or taken from the sports bag at the water Walter's um, crime scene, and a crushed orange juice bottle was found in the suitcase at the Lent crime scene. The bottle was empty and crushed, uh, but the lid and the seal were intact, and there was a small um, section of the uh, bottle's bottom punched by something sharp. Walter's fell flat face first and died on the floor without signs of a serious struggle. Lent um, fell back on his bed, uh, also without signs of a serious struggle. They were both facing their luggage at the time of death. Both had locked the doors of their rooms. Both had a small window open. Walters had illegal PEDs in his apartment, which I noted despite the fact there had been no direct corollary with the Lent scene. Walters was apparently single, and possibly a man who had sex with men. Lent was staying away from his wife during uh, the week due to his working as a consultant contractor. Um, neither man had any legal or illegal weapons in their possession. Neither was expected anywhere that evening or immediately following morning. And were it not for uh, Walter's neighbour and Lent's cleaner, they might still be undiscovered. Ash kept playing with his pen. Smith held a copy of Clark's summary graphic in both hands, running his eyes up and down the page. Uh, there's one more thing I'd like to add, please, Clark said. Uh, Smith seemed to have taken a taxi just before he entered the apartment and died. Lent did the same thing, according to the uh, hotel front desk staff. Smith looked up. Really? Do we have a cab firm? Not yet. Given Smith's interest, Clark took her request as granted and scrubbed on her copy notes for something to be added later. Uh, but I have already started to look at the local cab firms, and there seems to be only one main one within a five mile radius. Uh, Cavill Taxi Cabs Incorporated. Smith nodded. Okay, you can contact them and ask if they can check whether their accounts and drivers to see if Lent or Walters hired them on the night of their deaths or any other time. And if so, ask if they can send um, a log of their driver's activities that night. We may want to interview the drivers too, if we can find them. Clark scribbled notes. Ash underlined a few sentences. 
Okay, finally, Smith slid one file to the side and slid another in front of him and took a second to realign it to square on. Here's what I managed to get out of the lab regarding the quasi-legal street herb known as Lau, the substance we found in Lent's toiletry bag. I'll just give a brief overview. The full document has been added to the addendum uh, to the case files of both Lent and Walters. The broad strokes are that this substance is known to have not well studied. Uh, samples match a root of a herb referred to as Lau. In the past, it's been flagged as being used in combination with meth and DMT. Other samples were found reported to be used with ayahuasca, which it's supposed to have a great deal in common with chemically. Ayahuasca is usually made into a tea from the leaves of the, Smith sounded the words out carefully, Psychotrivivira dish shrub, along with the stalks of the Banai steropisiscapii vine. Other plants can be and are often added as well. In several instances, Lao was the term used to refer to what was added the most often. In terms of Lao's effect on the brain, it's said to have the effects of both ayahuasca and of DMT, with a hefty dose of LSD added to it. Jesus, Clark said, how is this still legal? It was at one time very rare and very hard to get at. So many governments were simply either totally unaware of its existence or they didn't know about its effects. Smith flipped over some documents as he smoothly transitioned between reading and speaking extemporaneously. Deforestation has meant it's become far easier to access, and while it only seeds once every few years, when it does, it grows like wildfire red algae levels of growth. So once someone could get to it, identify it, and be there at the right time to gather seeds, people have been able to grow large quantities of it. It started hitting the streets. There's been reports of mescaline and crack users turning to it as a substitute or an enhancer. What the toxicity and narcotics intel results suggest at the moment is that the current Lao being sold as a premium narcotic within inner metropolitan areas such as this one is filled to the brim with active ingredients. Much like skunk is a version of cannabis, and both of these modified strains were cultivated with ergot mold on it. Head shops are also selling it as a subherbalist, and it's being sold in some places as a muscle relaxant and being marketed much like CBT is being. The issue is much like with spice, it's going to be very difficult to build a case that should be illegal as it seems to mostly affect serotonin levels, meaning that if it's classified as an SSRI and in many other substances, including chocolate, could be implicated. Clark let out a slow stream of air through pursed lips and Ash suppressed a chuckle as he said, I've always known as the just fuzz my shids up for them chocolate bar. Smith acknowledged their reactions with raised eyebrows and a slow nod and continued. One of the possible side effects or overdose effects might be catastrophically high levels of serotonin within sensitive subjects. That in itself isn't always deadly, but serotonin acts as a neurotransmitter. So it could theoretically lead to paralysis and subsequent heart failure or asphyxiation in the same manner as an opiate overdose. I asked if it can be injected and the answer was yes, if placed in a solution, but it would usually be inhaled via smoking. So it could could have been the causal agent by which Walters and Lent met their ends, and it could potentially have been given to them or forced on them as a form of assault. But obviously, there's a lot of ifs there. Ash sat back in his seat and raised his pen. Could the Lao cocktail have a delayed effect? Walters and Lent ingested somehow, somewhere, took a taxi, and then the OD kicked in after the exertion of carrying their bags. Smith flipped the lab report over and back quickly. It doesn't say here. It, I do know that the usual thing is that the serotonin found was in the bloodstream, which suggests injection, and taking large quantities of Lao should, in theory, cause it to be released via the digestive tract or through the lungs first. That could lead to a delayed release. Maybe they consumed some via tea. Maybe they injected some or something similar. Maybe they were on SSRIs, which led to the increased cause and overdose. And they were getting the SSRIs illegally, so to avoid stigma. 
Ash tapped his pen in rapid succession, making a soft clacking sound. So should we ask the lab guys about a possible alert? This could be evidence there's a strong batch of lao out there, in which case it can cause a sterile overdose. Uh, we can put the word out to hospitals, emergency responders and so on. Clark nodded along with Ash's words and added, um, perhaps we could uh, put out an internal alert and include the chiefs and department heads. And then if they want to forward it up to the chain, uh, to our stakeholders, they can. Smith nodded. Yeah, yeah, that sounds good. Ash, could you please take care of the email alert and then forward it to myself for the nod before release? Clark, um, this summation is it's excellent. Uh, could you please forward this out in a second in, in a internal alert, asking for similar cases to be brought to this team's attention with the key alerts being at the moment um, things along the lines of lone male, serotonin, heart attack and locked room. Yeah, and I'll take what I've got so far and bring it up during the next team leaders meeting, um, which is now in a few days. Unless we get another case uh, fitting these alert criteria, I think we can put a pin in these cases until the coroner's reports are back in. Is everyone okay with that? Ash and Clark nodded their assent. Okay, thank you. And uh, let's get back at it. Um, are you both here this afternoon? Smith pushed his chair back and stood. Uh, I am until about four ish, Clark said. I can be, Ash nodded. It depends if you want me tomorrow. I'm only signed off for 20 hours this week, and yesterday and last night took up most of them. Can you give me 30 minutes or so to decide? If we get the alert out before midday, you can take the rest of the week off uh, if you want, or just um, head off now and do uh, a half day sometime within this week, so long as Clark is okay with that and you're able to divvy up the admin. I can't see another case fitting the MO of these two suddenly popping up in the next three days. I mean, I hope not anyway. Clark opened the door. Ash and Smith filed out, and Smith took the door from her, allowing her to leave, and followed her through. When they got back to their work area, a printout detailing another locked room case lay on each of their desks. 